Chapter 34 of The Seventh Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Robert Kuyper. The Seventh Man by Max Brand. Chapter 34. The Warning. All in a grim instant he saw the trap. It closed upon his consciousness with a click, and as he doubled Satan around he knew that the only escape was in running southeast along the banks of the Asper. Even that was a desperate, a forlorn chance, for if that omnipotent voice could reach from Rickert to Caswell City, fifty miles away, certainly it must have warned the river towns of Ganton and Wilsonville and Bly Falls, where Tucker Creek ran into the Asper. But this was no time for thinking. Already, looking back, he saw the posse changing their saddles to fifteen fresh mounts, and he headed Satan across the Wago Hills, west and south. It was hot work. Even the steel-wire muscles of Black Bart were weakening under the tremendous labors of that day, and as he scouted ahead his head was low and his red tongue lolled, and sure a sign of all, the bushy tail drooped. Yet it was time to make a new call upon both wolf-dog and horse, for the posse was racing after him as before, giving even the fresh willing mounts the urge of spurs and quirts. His hand ran down the dripping neck and shoulders of Satan. He called to him, and with a snort the stallion responded. He felt the quiver as the muscles tightened for the work. He felt the settling as Satan lengthened to racing speed, through the Wago Hills then, with Bart picking the way as before, and never a falter in the sweep of Satan's running. If his head was a little lower, if his ears lay flat, only the master knew the meaning, and still, when he spoke, the glistening ears pricked up and they bounded on to a greater speed than before. The flight of a gull on unstirring wings when the wind buoys it, the glide of water over the descent of smooth rock, with never a ripple, like all things effortless, swift, and free, such was the gait of Satan as he fled. Let them spur the fresh horses from Caswell City till their flanks dripped red, they would never gain on him. On through the hills, and now the heave of his great breaths told of the strain, down like an arrow into the rolling ground, and now they gallop beside the asper banks. The master looked darkly upon that water. Ten days before, when the snows had not yet reached the climax of melting, ten days later, when that climax was overpassed, the asper would have been fordable, but now a brown flood stormed along the gully, ate away the banks, undermined the willows here and there, and rolled stones larger than a man could lift. It went with an angry shouting, as if it defied the fugitive. It was narrow, maddeningly narrow, almost small enough to attempt a leap across to the safety of the thickets on the farther side, but the force of the water alone was enough to warn the bravest swimmer away, and here and there, like teeth in the mouth of a shark, jagged stones cut the surface, with white foam streaking out below them. As if to prove its power, even while Dan turned south along the bank, a dead trunk shot down the stream and split on one of Asper's teeth. Even then he felt the temptation. There lay the forest on the farther side, a forest which would shelter him, and above the forest, hardly a mile back, began the grisly peaks. They lunged straight up to snowy summits, and all along their sides blue shadows of the afternoon drifted through a network of ravines, a promise of peace, a surety of safety, if he could reach that labyrinth. He was almost glad when he left the mockery of the river's noise to turn aside for Ganton. There it lay in a bend of the Asper in the lowlands, and every town where men lived was an enemy. He could see them now gathered just outside the village, twenty men, perhaps, and fifteen spare horses, the best they had for the posse. On past Ganton, and again a call upon Satan to meet the first spurt of the posse on its new horses. There was something in the stallion to answer, some incredible reserve of nerve, strength, and courage. There was a slight labor now, and something of the same heave and pitch which comes in the gait of a common horse. Also, when he put Satan up the first slope beyond Ganton, he noted a faltering, a deeper lowering of the head. When his hoof struck a loose rock, he no longer had the easy recoil of the morning. He staggered like a graceful yacht chopped by a cross current. Now down the slope, now back to the roar of the asper once more, for there the going was most level. But always the strides were shortening, shortening, and the head of the stallion nodded at his work. 
All that was seen by Mark Retherton through his glasses, though they were almost close enough now to see details through the naked eye. He turned in the saddle to the posse, grim faces, sweat and dust clotted in their mustaches, their faces drawn and gray with streaks over the nose and under the eyes where perspiration ran. They rode crookedly now, for seventy miles at full speed had racked them, twisted them, cramped their muscles. Scotty kept his head tilted far back, for his spinal column seemed about to snap. Walsh leaned to his right side, which a tormenting pain drew at every stride and Hendricks cursed in gasps through a wry mouth. It had been an hour since Mark Retherton last spoke, and when he attempted it now, his voice was as hoarse as a croaking frog. "'Boys, buck up! He's done! You see the black laborin? You see it? Hey, Lou, Gary, we got the best horses among us three. Now's the time for a spurt, and by God we'll run him down. I'm startin'. He made his word good with an Indian yell and a wave of his hat that sent his buckskin leaping straight into the air to land with stiff legs, swallowing its head. But then it straightened out in earnest. That buckskin had a name from Bly Falls to Caswell City, speed and courage, and it lived up to the record in the time of need. Close behind it came Lou and Gary, ponies scarcely slower than the buckskin, and they closed rapidly on Satan. The plan of Retherton was plain now that the black was running on its nerve. A spurt might bring them within striking distance, and if they could check the flight for an instant by opening advance guard fire, they might drive the fugitive into a corner by the river and hold him there until the main body of the posse came up. The three of them running alone in the lead could do five yards for every four of the slow horses, and the effect showed at once. Going up a slope, the trot of the stallion maintained or even increased his lead, but when they reached the easier ground beyond, they drew rapidly upon him. They saw Barry bend low. They saw the stallion increase its pace. "'By God!' shouted Retherton in involuntary admiration. "'I'd rather have that horse than the ten thousand. But feed him the spurs, boys, and he'll come back to us inside a mile.' And Retherton was right. Before that mile was over, the black slipped back, inch by inch, until at length Retherton called, "'Now grab your guns, boys, and see if you can salt him down with lead. Give your horses their heads and turn loose.' They pulled their guns to their shoulders and sent a volley at the outlaw. One bullet clipped a spark from the rocks just behind the stallion's feet. The other two must have gone wide. Once more Barry flinched closer over the neck of Satan, and once again the horse answered with a fresh burst of speed but in a few moments he came back to them. Flesh could not stand that pace after seventy-five miles of running. They saw the rider straighten and look back. Then the sun flashed on his rifle. "'Feed him the spur!' shouted Retherton. "'If we can't hit him shooting ahead, he ain't got a chance to hit us shooting backwards.' For it is notoriously hard to turn in the saddle and accomplish anything with a rifle. One is moving away from the target instead of toward it, and every condition of ordinary shooting is reversed. Above all, the moment a man turns his head, he is completely out of touch with his horse. Apparently the fugitive knew this, and made no attempt to place his shots. He merely jerked his gun to the shoulder and blazed away as soon as it was in place. Half a dozen yards in front of Retherton, the bullet kicked up the dust. "'I told you,' he shouted. "'He can't do nothing that way. Close in, boys. Close in, for God's sake!' He was himself flailing with his quirt, and the buckskin grunted at every strike. Once more the rifle pitched to the outlaw's shoulder, and this time the bullet clicked on a rock ten feet from Retherton, and again on a straight line for him. "'Damned if that ain't shootin!' called Gary, and Retherton, alarmed, swung the buckskin out to one side to throw the marksman out of line. He had turned again in the saddle, and as though the episode were at an end, restored his rifle to the case. But when they poured in another volley about him, he swung sharply round about again, gun in hand. Once more the rifle went to his shoulder, and this time the bullet knocked a puff of dust into the very nostrils of the buckskin. Retherton reined in with an oath. "'He's been warning me, boys,' he called. "'That devil has the range like he was sitting on a rocking chair, shooting at a tin can. He's warning us back to the rest of the gang, and damned if we ain't going.' It was quite patent that he was right, for three bullets sent on a line for one horse, and each of them closer could mean only one thing. They checked their horses, and in a moment the rest of the posse was clattering around them. "'It don't make no difference,' called Retherton, saving in time. 
Maybe he'll last to Wilsonville, but he can't stay in three miles when we hang on to him with fresh horses. The black is running on nothing but guts right now. End of chapter 34